Michael McLean and welcome to episode 12 of the Mark One Escort RS2000 Reassembly and also welcome to the new year. Let's all hope we have a much, much better year this year. I'm sure, like me, you've all missed the car shows. I've missed the car shows massively. They're my inspiration. You turn up, you see what other people have done, you take inspiration from other people's projects and you end up with your own project. So yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful and confident that this year should be much, much better than last year. Let's be honest, it, it struggled to be, you know, it struggled to be any worse. So I'm going to get on with some jobs now that uh, of some of the parts I've got over Christmas. So I'll share some of them items with you now. Uh, I'm also got a paper from Calipers, which is probably going to be the first job. So I'll go through some of them items uh, and we'll take it from there. So as I mentioned in a previous video, these are princess calipers, Austin princess calipers. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. They're brand new. They look great. But this, I think it's a zinc coating. It doesn't last very long. It, tarnish, it tarnishes. And in no time at all, these calipers will look absolutely terrible. So the first job I'm going to do is I'm just going to whip them off, strip them down, take the calipers out. I'm not taking the pistons or anything like that out. I'm just going to mask off uh, the main parts of the caliper. But I'll take, obviously, the pads out, um, the bleed nipples, everything, block all them, them uh, galleries up, and I'm going to paint them in the Sebring red uh, car body colour. So I'll whip them off, I'll paint them and then I'll let you see them when they're painted. Obviously I'm not going to uh, video them being painted because well that would be like watching paint dry wouldn't it? So while the first coat of paint's drying on the calipers I thought I would fit these as I've just received them. And I really really like these plates. They're uh, obviously period style but they're pressed. They're aluminium pressed plates. So obviously the the letters are, are very very slightly raised. And the back also. For some reason, I think it looks even better on the back than it does on the front. Not sure why, but yeah, that's another little job out the way. And it's finally got its identity. Well, I've got to say, in all the years I've been painting, and I always use decent quality paints, no matter what I'm hand painting, I've never painted with a paint as lovely to apply as this. This is Imron, uh, which is basically, basically an automotive stroke coach builders kind of paint they use it on a lot of wagons buses that kind of stuff and it's basically a top coat so you don't have to lacquer it it's it, you know it's lacquer and, and top coat in one and the beauty of it is it's designed to be hand brushed yeah to be brush painted and it's this is the first time i've ever brush painted with it but what a lovely lovely paint it is to apply you just hard, add um it's three parts paint to one part hardener mix it up uh, it's quite it's quite thin i mean you don't put thinners in with it but it's quite thin anyways but it doesn't run very easily it applies really nice great coverage and the shine is is absolutely stunning if if i'd got these done somewhere and someone said to me oh we decided to spray them i wouldn't disbelieve them because there isn't a paint stroke in sight they just look like they've been sprayed um so yeah i've heard a lot of good things about him ron and i've got i've got to say i'm a fan that's the nicest paint i've ever brush painted in my life and I'm really pleased with the finish. Really, really pleased with the finish. So all I've got to do now is clean all the ma all the um, mating faces up, unmask it all, make sure all the faces where the pads go in are all nice and clean again, build them back up, and then I'll show you a little bit of footage when they're finally fitted back to the car again. And there they are, built back up again. All the machine uh, machine faces all cleaned back again. Uh, pads back in. Uh, basically ready to go back onto the car which is exactly what i'm going to do now i think they'll look even better now they've got a couple of different contrasting colors on them as well so yeah we'll get them put back on the car and then i'll show you them when they're back on the car so you can see the difference from now till how they were before and there we have another little job complete both calipers back on the car uh, and i think they'll look a lot better than they did before and obviously now these calipers well, they've got a bit more protection than they had with just the zinc coating. They're now going to obviously last and they'll clean really easy because they're a super gloss, you know, super gloss, uh, high shine finish. So, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely be easier for cleaning because the uh, the zinc coating was very, it was a bit like a, a rough casty kind of surface. It was a, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a flat uh, machine surface. So I think painting them will just help to keep them, uh, preserve them and keep them clean. So I'll put up a picture now just to show before and after side by side so you can see the difference that painting these calibers has made.
So while we're on the subject of brake calipers, I thought I would discuss the requirements for piping these calipers up correctly. Now, for those of you fitting uh, Austin Princess calipers, you'll probably be aware that there's certain ways that these pie, these calipers can be uh, can be piped up. So I thought I would just go through the options that I'm aware of to correctly connect up these calipers. One option is, has, as you can see here, and basically I've run a link pipe from this brake pipe fitting up to the innermost brake pipe fitting on the flat face on the top, and then a link pipe from the outermost brake pipe fitting to the bracket on the strut. We then take, obviously, a flexible hose from that bracket to the body. The pipe on the inside is already made up, as you've seen in the earlier videos. So that's a flexible hose, a flexible braided or hose I'll be fitting, which goes from that fitting across down into this bracket. Obviously, it's flexible for movement. So that's, uh, that's one way of connecting up these brake calipers. The other option, option two, is you do away with this link and just fit uh, probably just a brake uh, bleed nipple into this into this fitting here. So you get get rid of this link, and you take one pipe from the outermost fitting around up to the t to a t piece that you'll mount on this bracket. Another pipe from the innermost brake pipe fitting around again, following the same route up to the same t piece mounted on this bracket. Then you take one pipe from that t piece up to your body. So it'll be one pipe from the body to the T-piece on the strut, and then two pipes from that T-piece to the top two fittings on the caliper. And like I say, you just blank this one off with a bleed nipple. That's two options that I'm aware of uh, for piping up Austin Princess calipers. Now this information is readily available online. That is where I got the information myself. But I did say in a previous video that I will cover this bit of detail in one of my videos. Hence the reason why I've just covered this bit of detail here. So, uh, as you'll probably see, the, the pipe does protrude from the caliper uh, a fair amount. And that might, may be an issue if you were running, uh, say, maybe 12, 13 inch wheels. But because this is a bubble arch car, I'm actually going to be fitting 15 inch wheels to really fill them bubbles up. And I'm very, very confident after doing some measurements that there'll be at least an inch clearance from the outer edge of that pipe to the rim. So I'm fairly confident we'll have no issues there at all. And just a little tip from myself, for those of you who are as anal as me, probably not many, if you're making pipes, as I have today with these copper pipes, you'll tend to find, after a couple of days, all the oils and the residue from your skin makes these pipes discolour and you'll come to them a couple of days later and they'll look absolutely awful they'll look all tarnished so what i tend to do after i've made the brake pipes up and fitted them i just go over them with a bit of instant show shine or a bit of a bit of car polish something like that just to take off them oily residue all them fingerprints off the off the copper and then you'll find that when you come to it at a later date they're still nice and shiny so just a little uh a little tip there if you're uh, as anal as i am with uh with this kind of stuff but i think we've gone as far as we need go now with brake calipers so i'll probably leave that there just want to say a massive massive thanks to my cousin Anthony mclean who's done this for me absolutely brilliant this was brian off uh off the fast and the furious ford escort and he's basically uh done it in the sebring red with the with the uh, rs stripes and everything and uh the funniest thing for me is this is cross brian out and put dut Dutt's Ford Escort. Now, Dutt was always my nickname right through school. It uh, obviously my second name's McLean. It got ch changed to Dirt and then uh, and then Dutt, and it's just stuck down the years. It's uh, everyone calls me Dutt as, as a nickname, uh, and I was absolutely howling at that. He's done a hell of a job of it. He he does this kind of stuff all the time. He restores dinky cars. He'll take an old wagon, an old bus, or an old car. And he'll restore it to you know it'll look a wreck when it starts and then when it's finished it'll look like a brand new uh brand new car you get in the box so thank you very very much and this will be taken pride of place on my dash at coming shows in future thanks again so there we go guys that's the badges you've seen in the last video that my mum got me for christmas fitted to the boot and the bonnet i'll be honest they weren't the easiest thing i've ever fitted i think the issue with them is they're obviously made and then they're chromed and i think the pins are just a little bit oversized after the chroming process um 
So the original badges, they had like a little metal insert. Uh, I think I don't know if you can get still get the metal inserts, but now the uh, you tend to fit them with the little plastic ones, which is basically what these are. And then these fit into the holes that are already pre-drilled in the panels. And then the pins are designed to fit into that hole. And what I've had to do is I've had to run a drill bit in and out, just running in and out of that uh, of that clip, just to open it out to accept the pins. And once you do it, it doesn't take much doing. Uh, they do fit relatively well after that. Uh, it's just something to bear in mind when you come to fit them. Now, while we're on the subject of these pins, these little uh, inserts, sorry, on eBay, these go for anywhere between 750 and 10 pound for a pack of 10, which for what they are, I think is ridiculous because when you, when you think of how many you need for the full car, you need two or three packs. Uh, and just for a little tiny plastic clip like that, so, Again, as I mentioned in the last video, how fantastic my wife is at times, she found that this place here, Retro Bolts, they do them for two ninety nine. I think it's free postage as well. So a hell of a saving if you're thinking about getting these clips. That's uh, that's the address of Retro uh, Retro Bolts. I think she just found them on the internet. But yeah, a damn sight cheaper than seven fifty or ten pound for a pack of ten. Uh, so yeah, just a little tip there if you if you're looking at getting some of these clips, and there we have the badges fitted to the front. I said they were a bit of a pain, and the back wasn't too bad. The back, once you drilled the insert out, the insert fitted into the hole in the boot lid perfectly, and they weren't too bad. But the bonnet was a right pain. The holes on the bonnet were much much smaller than they should be. There were tiny tiny little holes. So I don't know whether there's different different style of badge from you know from earlier or whatever i don't know but what i had to do here is i had to open out the holes for these badges to 4.5 mil which i don't like doing because it's a brand new painted shell and i'd like the paint to stay on inside them holes but i had absolutely no choice because the holes were that small that you know the, the the badge would hardly fit on would barely fit on without the inserts the small the holes were really that small so i had to drill them out to 4.5 mil touch up with a bit of paint and then obviously just fit the uh, the badges back on. But yeah, they look absolutely spot on. And the other little job I've done today is fit the quarter bumpers. Uh, absolutely beautiful beautiful fit. No issues at all with them. Nothing that uh, springs to mind anyways. Uh, really nice fit, bolted on great. I didn't, even, I didn't have to tweak them or anything, tweak the brackets. I expected to maybe have to tweak the brackets a little bit to make them fit how I wanted, but there was none of that. They basically fit exactly how they're designed to. So just something else worth remembering as well. I don't know if you can just see down in there, you can see the, the bracket, and basically there's a bolt that comes through from the inside, and the end of the bolt will be on the outside. So it's always worth just touching up them bolts on the back, on the outside, I've touched it up with some black paint, so there's no bare metal. On the inside, in under the inner wing, I've painted the bolt head orange, just to stop it corroding. I've used stainless steel washes, etc., as well. Uh, and bolts where I can, just to uh, you know to try and prevent corrosion. So yeah, that's the next last little job today out the way. And uh, again, it's one of them jobs that really, really transforms the car. It it, uh, it gives it its face almost. Once we get the headlights and the grill on, you know we really will be uh, we really will be looking the part. You know something I've always wondered. If any of you guys know the answer to this question, please feel free to leave some comments. It would be my absolute dream to build cars like this for customers in the same way that Retro Power do for their customers. If you haven't seen any Retro Power's builds, please go and have a look at them on, uh, on YouTube. Their builds are absolutely phenomenal. They're probably the best in Britain. Uh, bespoke builds beyond your imagination. They do everything in-house from the interior to the paint job, all aspects of the build. But how on earth do you get that that uh, that base of of customer? Because I have not long sat down and worked out that I, if I was to charge myself thirty pound an hour for all the hours I've spent on this so far, we're talking ninety seven thousand pound, and that's without the paint job, and that's without the parts. So if I started my own company and someone come to me and said, right, I want you to build me an Escort similar to this, I want these brakes, I want this interior, this engine, 
then a realistic figure for me to build it for them would be 130, 140, 150 grand. But who is going to turn round and say, yeah, no problem, I'll give you that kind of money for you to build me a 1970s Mark I Escort. I just could never see it happening. As much as I'd love to do it, I'd love to set up my own business and employ two or three guys. I know some, I've got some good mates that are uh, also good at the, you know, this kind of stuff, and I reckon we could do it. But how do you get that base of customer that is happy to hand over that amount of money and trust you with that build? I really don't know. I imagine it's got to be something down, something to do with the reputation, but you've got to get that reputation to start with. It's something I've always wondered. I've always wondered how you would set up something like that because this would be a dream for me to build, to build awesome cars for people in the same way Retro Power does. So if you guys know, you know, you know exactly how that would be, how would I be able to make that materialise? Please leave some comments. I'd be really interested to know. Anyways, back to the build. So today wasn't supposed to be a garage day. I wasn't planning on coming in the garage today, but the wife had to go somewhere with her dad. And she said, is there anything you can get on with? And I said, Yasmin, you know me, there's always something I can get on with in that garage. So I decided to make these. Uh, and what these are are the clamps that hold the rear light clusters in place. I didn't have any. I did find them on eBay. They were about 28 quid for a pair. And then postage on top of that, it was over 30 quid. And I thought, you know what? A couple of hours, I can make them. They're so simple. So that's what I've done today. I've made these out of 3 mil steel. Uh, cut them, filed them, got them perfectly square. And then obviously drilled the hole in the middle for the bolt on the light unit. And then primed them and painted them satin black. So they're just drying off above the radiator now. I'll get them fitted and I'll show you exactly how they fit. The only thing I am going to do to them is on the bottom of these feet, where they touch the body, I'm going to put little rubber little rubber feet on them so that we're, uh, we're not, we don't have metal on metal on the body. But I'll show you that in a second. And there's them brackets I was just showing you before, uh, fitted onto the rear light unit. As you can see, I've fitted a little rubber, little rubber feet to them so we're not having uh, the edge of the metal bracket sitting against the body. So we've now got protection between the two. We've got uh, spring washers as well, stop it coming loose. Uh, and that's pulled the light units in nice and tight. So I think that's been a job well done. I've done the same with the other side as well. The other one is quite a bit harder to get into. It wouldn't be if I took the tank out, but yeah, it's a bit harder to get into at present. But uh, I think it's been worthwhile because when I looked on eBay, I said there was a set for 28 quid and there was six pound postage on top of that. So, you know, you're talking about 34 quid I've saved there for a couple of hours work, which was nothing at all. So yeah, another little job complete. So the other little job I've done today is made two of these. Uh, these are obviously the pins that open and lock the door from the inside. I'll show the, I'll show you them fitted soon. <laughs> Again, I got these off eBay. I think it was £22 for a pair. If I was going to stick with originality, really, these should be black. And I did think about getting them in black. But I'm a sucker for chrome. I absolutely love chrome. So I, I couldn't look past these. They're the same price in chrome and I really like the look of them. Uh, so yeah, I bought a pair of them. And I've made the little ink rods. They're very, very easy to do out of... The basic, it's been basically made out of two and a half mil uh, welding rods. These are welding rods for gas welding, but they're really rigid in, in small sections. Uh, and I basically made them the right length. I've bonded them into the edge of the pin and they now fit a treat. I'll show you them fitted in a second. But I didn't have these at all. So hence the reason why I've had to make the rods and I've had to buy the pins. Uh, and all the, the only other thing you need is a rubber grommet that goes around the hole. But again, I'll show you that in a second. There we go. Absolutely chuffed with that. A pair of them fit. Absolutely superb. No issue at all, they fit really, really easily. And now you can see coming down into the mechanism, the rod I made, and I've just fitted a little solderless nipple just to stop that, uh, that little rod sliding out. But yeah, that's absolutely bob on. And again, saved quite a lot of money, I would have thought, because I would say if, I'm, if I was to buy a pair of these from uh, from a Ford supplier, 
uh, classic Ford supplier, I'll probably pay a pretty penny like everything else with classic Ford. So another job, tick off the list, another job completed and another job I'm really, really happy with. Just one more little thing. I noticed on one of the Ford pages on Facebook, a guy had actually got some really small 10 mil diameter or 10 mil diameter ish gel type stickers and bonded them into the center of the pin on his car. And there were a little RS badge. I think there were a, like a blue background with the RS letters and it looked really, really smart. Uh, I don't know where I'd get any such badge. I have had a look and I can't seem to find them. If anyone's got any idea, about 10 mil diameter, like I say, gel type, small RS badge, just to bond into the center of there. Uh, into the centre of that pin, please let me know. Uh, it's just a lovely little attention to detail kind of thing, and I wouldn't mind. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing myself. So the next little thing I've been doing is making this bracket. Now this bracket is supposed to be spot welded onto the underside of the bonnet, and it's. I've got to be honest. I've dropped a little bit of a clanger because that is to hold the bonnet stay onto the bottom edge of the bonnet, but my bonnet is an early type bonnet there was actually a um, a water jet in the center of the bonnet that i had to weld that i welded up and i've got to be honest i didn't notice that this bracket for the bonnet stair was missing i think the bonnet stair is mounted differently on an early bonnet uh, so basically i've made this bracket i'll show you a picture now of an original fitted to a bonnet on my uh, on one of my friends mark one mexico's and as you can see it's uh, it's very, very similar. I've tried to copy it in shape and size. And the only difference will be mine will be bolted through using two fancy stainless steel bolts. I'm actually going to put captive nuts into the bottom, uh, the lip on the bonnet where it goes on to. It's, a, it's an enclosed box section that it bolts to, so you won't see the back of the bolts. All you'll see is the two heads on the front. So that's a little job I've done today. I've made that bracket. Um, and there is an easier way to make these brackets and it's called getting it right first time. You know, I made a balls up with the first one, got all the angle wrong and everything. I held it on the bonnet and it just looked awful. So yeah, it does help to get things right first time. It saves you a lot of hassle. So I've also primed up the bonnet stair as well. And now both the bonnet stair and the bracket will be painted in the Sebring red and i'll let you see them both when they're finally fitted properly right that's the bracket i made and the bonnet stay both coated in three coats of sebring i used the same paint as what i used on the caliper that i showed you earlier in the video which is the imron paint and they've now had three coats so i'm now going to get them bolted to the car so now it's time to fit the bracket i've just showed you to the underside of the bonnet and this is the kit i'm going to be using this is a very very nice kit it's one of my favorite bits of kit actually there uh, doesn't actually belong to me but it belongs to a good friend but i'll show you for anyone who doesn't know how these work exactly how they work because they really are a like i said they're a great bit of kit so let me just set the camera up so basically what you have you have these now these are um some people call them riv nuts, other people call them captive nuts. I always call them captive nuts. And what they have is a thread inside to accept various different size bolts. In the kit there, there's uh, there's various sizes, uh, M4, 5, 6, 10, 12, etc. Different sizes. And what you do, you take one and you measure it. So I always use vernier caliper for measuring. And that one is shown 7.5mm, so that means I need to drill a seven and a half mil hole to it to accept that insert so then you screw one of these inserts onto your captive nut tool which is exactly what this is and then you drill the hole in your steel panel that you want your riv nut or your captive nut to insert into so there's the bit of plate with the hole in you slot it through and then basically you hold the bar and you turn the, the knob at the bottom clockwise and what happens is You'll see the little serrated section there, just at the bottom. I'm not going to waste one because, as I say, it's my mate's kit, and I don't think he'd be too impressed in me wasting, uh, you know, a riv nut for the case of uh, a demonstration. And what happens is, this section here drops down and leaves a mushroom, kind of a mushroom shape, which then holds this threaded section solid 
into the plate and then when you unscrew this uh, this part of the kit off I'll show you your left if I can get it to come off a little bugger to plane up you left basically with that threaded insert into steel but you can take various different sizes of bolts uh, this is an M5. I've decided to use an M5 on, for my um, for my application. And there you go. You don't have to get a spanner on the back. Once that's cr uh, crimped into place, it leaves a perfect thread on the inside of a panel. And if you can't see the back section, uh, well, it's great because obviously you can't get in the back to uh, to put a spanner on or a ratchet or whatever. I will, however, point out that these are for light duty only. I once seen a post. On uh, on Facebook and people were talking about using them for seatbelt anchor points and I actually made a point of replying and saying absolutely do not use these for seatbelt anchor points because on the back they only get a small contact surface with the back of the plate. If you put too much load on it it will rip it right out the steel. They're not for things like uh, engine mounts or seatbelt mounting points. They're for light duty stuff such as wing mirrors, small brackets, that kind of thing. So bear that in mind if you're going to use these. They are not heavy duty. They're for light duty purposes only. So let me try my best to show you the process of fitting the captive nut into the bonnet here as I've just explained. So I use the tool as I've just showed you and you simply insert it into the hole like that till it's flush and then basically hold the handle and turn. You don't want to go too mad with the turning because you can actually strip the threads out of the inserts. You basically turn it. I can already feel that that's now gone solid. It's solid inside the, uh, the structure. But you keep turning it until it basically stops. So there we are, it's now stopped. Now all I need to do now is unscrew that. Out of the insert, out of the threaded insert. And we now have uh, an insert that I'll show you a close-up of in a second after I've done the second one. I'm going to go ahead and do the second one. There's no point in the video in it again. And I'll show you a close-up. But that just leaves a really lovely professional finish like factory. There you go. Close-up. Both inserts fitted. And as you can see, you have an inserted thread. And we don't need to get to the back to hold anything in place. A lovely neat job as I've just said. So let's get the bracket fitted. I'll now try and show you a picture from the back of these threaded inserts to show you how it crimps if I can. And there's our bracket bolted in place. I was actually lying in bed the other night and I thought of a better way I could have done this if I'd gave it a bit of extra thought to start with. I could have actually on the back of here inserted two studs welded the studs in, dressed it flat from the front, and then you'd have been left with this bracket with two st studs sticking off the back, and then I could have got in behind and put nuts on. And I could have also cheated and used the spot welder to put some fake spots on the front of the bracket to make it look like it was spot welded. But I realized this by the time the bracket was already painted. So I so did it stain as it is, it still looks really good. Uh, the, uh, the bolts have got spring washers in there, uh, normal washers, so it won't come loose. And I'll show you now a side-by-side -side image of this bracket and an original, so you can see the lightning of, you know, just, just how similar it is. And there we go. We have a proper bonnet there, and the wife will be happy that the bit of wood is now gone. She, like I say, she used to come in all the time and say, when are you getting rid of that bit of wood? Anyways, that's now fitted properly. Uh, I've also fitted the clip at the bottom that holds it in place when the bonnet's down. And we're all good. Now, this is something I'm probably going to have to do something with. Because obviously, as the bar sits on top of the inner wing, it's going to mark the inner wing. That's just how they were. But I don't know if you've, you've have seen uh, Gordon Murray's Mark One Escort and Retro Power actually redesigned this bracket. They made one that uh, it was like a... A bolt, a bolt on piece that took off the section, the uh, original spot welded bracket, and the made one with a basin. 
which had like a section of rubber or something like that in for it to sit on. It was quite a cool idea. I maybe should have done something similar myself, but I'll figure somewhere out just to sit in the bottom of there to stop the inner wing getting marked. But there we go, we have a proper bonnet steer. Now I'd like to say a massive thank you to some of the viewers because in a, in a previous video, I asked for some help in locating some items for the doors, uh, being the bars that run down either side of the sliding windows to hold the window channels in place. And I've had amazing, absolutely amazing responses from the viewers. People sending me links, giving me ideas where I can get them from. And I've been blown away by the generosity of a lot of the viewers. I've heard a lot of YouTubers say about about how fantastic the viewers are, but it's not until you uh, you know you experience it yourself do you realise just exactly what they mean. And one person in, in particular, Scott Reed, has went right out of his way to not only uh, put a post out in New Zealand where he lives on a, on, a, on a site for anyone that has any but he's also bought them uh, and he's going to send them over to me and I'll obviously have to send him the money over but he's went right out of his way to do that and I think that's absolutely amazing uh, you know to go to them lengths to help a viewer out absolutely awesome I'm really really chuffed to bits thank you very very much Scott it's very very much appreciated and to the rest of the viewers who have helped me out and uh, and sent me links, I really, really do appreciate it. And it's uh, it's more than I ever expected. Thanks very much. Well, guys, today we think we're at the top of Sail Fell. We're not fell experts, but what an absolute gorgeous, beautiful winter's day it is. Lovely out here. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to leave this video here. So I'll see you very, very shortly, guys. As long as I can get down this fell without breaking my neck. See you soon.